And you have a lot of brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe who love you as well, whether you know them or not. In the book of Acts, chapter 14 and verse 27, we can read that after Paul and Barnabas had finished their first journey, uh, they'd come and gathered the church together. They reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Later on in the book of Acts, as uh, Paul returns to Jerusalem, you can read in Acts chapter 21 and verse 19, he greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. I want to tell you tonight about some things that God has done through us in working in Zimbabwe and through many others who've worked there over the years. Zimbabwe is, uh, of course, a, a nation in southern Africa. It used to be Rhodesia. It won its independence uh, in the early 1980s, I believe. A man by the name of Robert Mugabe uh, led a revolution. Many of the whites were uh, thrown out of what was then Rhodesia. Um, southern Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. Northern Rhodesia became Zambia. And since that time, uh, Zimbabwe has, has suffered uh, a lot from political malfeasance, economic problems, uh, all sorts of issues. And they've really devolved from a nation that was a first world nation into very much a third world nation where poverty is rampant. There are about 15 million people in this country uh, maybe a lot of people have left to find work, to find, um, you know, livelihood in South Africa as well. I tell people that Zimbabwe is uh, to South Africa what Mexico is to us. Uh, as Mexicans come to America to find, uh, you know, a land of plenty and work and uh, to be able to provide for their families, a lot of people from Zimbabwe go to South Africa to try to provide for their families. But there are hundreds of sound churches and thousands of Christians in the nation of Zimbabwe. Uh, the work there was started over a hundred years ago. So the gospel uh, has been known there for at least a hundred years. I don't know what happened in the first and second century there, or if there were even people there then, but I do know in the last hundred years the gospel has been there and been there strong. Some of you may have heard of Foy Short, and I'll talk about, about him more in a minute. He did a lot of work, especially in southwestern Zimbabwe. But in this country, as I mentioned, there is a, a lot of poverty. Uh, the poverty line given by the nation of Zimbabwe for a family of four in that country is $650 a month. So if you're making $650 a month, they consider you to be in poverty. Now, honestly, $650 a month in Zimbabwe is about like $650 a month here. That's about as far as it goes. Um, and yet, we would say anybody making that much or only that much in our country, a family of four, we'd say, well, they're definitely in poverty. Over 70% of the people in Zimbabwe fall below that line, over 70%. Unemployment is rampant. Um, depends on who does the estimating and how they count a person being employed. If you leave out the subsistence farmers, unemployment may be as high as 90%. Zimbabwe is uh, one of the poorest countries on earth. Uh, it's often listed as high as two or three among the poorest countries on earth. So you have a lot of brethren there. There's a lot of poverty. There's not much opportunity for advancement or for earning a living in Zimbabwe. Although I'll say this, their education system is very good. They're an educated people. They're an intelligent people. And they don't mind working. They're hardworking people. Uh, Zimbabwe... Uh, you realize that the nation as it is, is, is a nation that is made up of uh, African tribes, which didn't follow the same boundaries as the lines that were drawn by Europeans when they uh, took over this part of the world. And so there are two main tribes that make up the nation of Zimbabwe now. They're the Shauna and the Indibeli. There are a couple of other tribes, uh, one to the far south, the Vinda, and one to the far north, the Tonga. They make up only about 5 or 10% of the population, but the Shauna and the Indibeli make up 90% uh, or more of the population. And the land could be divided something like this. Shauna are the controlling tribe. Uh, they are in charge. They have the government sort of in their pocket. They're the biggest in number. And so they're, they're the group that has the power. And the area of the country where they live is a little bit better off than the southwestern area where the Indibeli live. 
we worked uh, a, a lot among uh, both tribes, among both groups, as well as some Tonga and some Vinda, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit. But I want to tell you about the gospel going to these two different areas. Foy Short, uh, who many of you may have heard of, spent many decades in Africa, uh, passed away just a couple of years ago, um, did a lot of wonderful work, especially among the Indabeli. Uh, and following him, we have people like uh, Patty Kindeball and Lessa Linda Maydell, uh, people that you've probably heard of who, did, who have done tremendous work uh, in the Bulawayo area and among the Indabeli. The Shauna story is somewhat different. Um, what happened in Mashana land is that um, the, our institutional brethren went in there and a number of years ago started a preacher training school in Mutari. Mutari is a, to this far border over here. Um, they started a preacher training school there and uh, were highly successful for a time. Uh, there was one Shauna preacher by the name of Tinson Manguignana who uh, sort of studied his, he went to Matari School of Preaching, but he studied his way out of institutionalism. Thanks to Les and Linda Maydale, some materials he's heard he got from the United States. He, he studied his way out of that, and he began to share uh, what he believed the truth of the gospel to be concerning the work of the church and the organization of the church. He began to share that with fellow preachers who were there in uh, the Matari School of Preaching, um, among them even some of the instructors there. And over a period of time, uh, a good many of those men came out of institutionalism, learned the truth, and are standing for the truth even today. And by a good many, I mean two or three dozen at least. These men are well-trained in the scriptures, having been trained in this school of preaching. They are typically very articulate men, very intelligent men, uh, men who you can study the Greek with, that sort of thing. <laughs> really uh, top-notch individuals. Many of them now uh, standing for the truth on institutionalism and everything else in this Shauna part of the country. So you have two different tribes. Uh, the story of how sound doctrine got among those two different tribes is much different. Uh, the tribes themselves have some interaction, but not just a whole lot. Uh, and so you're almost talking about going to two different countries when you go there. The, the culture of the Indabeli is a good bit different than the Shauna. The Indabeli tend to be very laid back. They're easy to talk to. They, they, they laugh readily. The Shauna are uh, much more intense people. They're a get-in-your-face kind of people. And uh, they're a get-it-done get kind of people. And so the culture is much different between, between the two. And all of that, I think, is important to know for what I'm about to share with you concerning the work over there. In 2011, I was invited for the first time by Patty Kindeball to go to Zimbabwe. He was living at that time in Bulawayo, and he invited myself and Bob and David Watson to come over and do a preacher training where he would have a, a number of these would be Indabelli preachers come meet at this church building. This is one of only two churches in all of Zimbabwe that has services in English, uh, but he had us come there, had a bunch of uh, Indabelli preachers meet us there, and we spent several days in preacher training, helping these guys develop as preachers. Um, and just to give you an idea of the Indabelli's needs, as opposed to the Shauna, who uh, are typically highly educated in the word and have had a lot of training, a lot of these men had just come out of the villages. Um, most of them did not even know what a concordance was they were using only their Bibles to preach from. The week that, the, that we were there in 2011, uh, Foy Short had worked with a few men and, and, and published a concordance in the Indabelli language of the Indabelli Bible. We had those concordances with us, and we purchased enough of them to give to every man in this preacher study. You would have thought we had given them gold. They couldn't believe that such a thing as a concordance existed. <laughs> you mean, you know, where you could just think of a word and look it up and find where that was in the Bible and be able to study, you know, through the Bible, that particular word and how it's used and all that sort of thing. You've got to be kidding. You know, it was kind of the way they thought about it. And so you would have thought we had given them gold. But from that experience, both Patty Kindeball and myself agreed that this 
this method of, of helping the brethren in Zimbabwe would be very, very effective. We can go over there and we can go to villages and preach in a village uh, to 30 or 40 people maybe and possibly baptize one or two. And we've done a good bit of that. But if we can get 40 village preachers together to come hear us for three or four days in intense Bible studies, they can take all that to the villages a lot better than we can. And so we multiply our effectiveness, we feel, when we have these preacher training uh, sessions with guys. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you is how we've done that in, in the year since 2011. In 2012, uh, I came down with cancer and my trip to Zimbabwe was canceled. A couple of guys who I was supposed to go with went ahead and went. They went back to Bulawayo and did some more training there. 2013, uh, I went to South Africa. By that time, Patty had been kicked out of Zimbabwe and he was in South Africa. And we talked a lot about the work in Zimbabwe, about how he wanted to go back and do work there, but he was forbidden. He had visa problems and other problems. And so we talked a lot about the work in Zimbabwe and how we could further it and how we could go forward in that work. In 2014, I was invited uh, by Tinson Mangbanyana, who I mentioned a little bit ago, who preaches in Victoria Falls. I was invited to come to Victoria Falls and with two other brethren, Joe Greer and Tad Quarter, uh, present a series of preacher training lessons for men whom Tinson selected from all over, mainly the Shauna area of the country, but a few in the belly as well. He picked, handpicked, the preachers who he thought were the strongest, could be of the most influence, uh, who, if we could get them all headed in the right direction, would be able to do the most good with the most power throughout Zimbabwe. He asked us to preach on specific things, to teach on specific things with these preachers. Things like Bible authority, things like the work of the church, things like the work of a preacher, developing elders in congregations. There are only two congregations in the whole country that have elders. And so those kinds of basic things that are vital to the work, Tinson wanted us to preach and teach these men who gathered in Victoria Falls in 2014. These would be, again, in Tinson's mind at least, the cream of the crop. As you look at this uh, photo, uh, here's Tinson in the striped shirt, uh, small man down in the middle. He, uh, as I said, uh, was an impetus for a lot of this. Uh, there's Joe Greer, there's Tad Corder, and there's me with my face in the shade. As you'll notice, uh, usually it's not very hard to pick me out in some of these photos as my face is much whiter and my head is much bigger than most of the other guys in most of these photos. Um, but that was, that was that study. And so from that, what happened was, uh, from 2011 then to 2017, we have had preacher studies in... Uh, seven different places, eight different studies in those years, usually with 30 to 45 preachers, often different preachers than we had the year before. Uh, and, and in this way, I've been able to meet um, probably a couple hundred uh, gospel preachers of varying abilities, different languages, different tribes, working in different areas, some in small villages, some in big cities, uh, their work and their abilities varies like it does with American preachers as far as that goes. Uh, but uh, been able to get to know some of them in intensive Bible studies, one-on-ones, sometimes going with them to their villages. So this is the work that we focused on. Now that's not to say we haven't got out to the villages ourselves. In fact, in these years, I've been able to preach in 21 different congregations in cities, mainly in the villages around Zimbabwe, along with Joe and Tad. This is the work that God is doing through us. This is the work that support from American Brethren has enabled us to do. And, and we feel like God has blessed the work generously in uh, helping us share the gospel, not only in these villages, but as I've said, especially with uh, gospel preachers who are, who are laboring to be better grounded in the word and better able to do the work that God would have them to do in this great country of Zimbabwe. There is Joe and Tad and I this last year 
on our trip in 2017. And what I'd like to do then for a good bit of the rest of our time is just let me tell you about our 2017 trip. It will give you a, a feel for, more of a feel for what we're doing, uh, more of a feel especially for the work that is there and the work that God has done among the people of Zimbabwe. Um, we started this last year with a preacher training uh, in Binga at a place called Milabizi. Uh, it's on the very northern border on the Zambezi River. Uh, Zambia is right across the river there. Um, and this was with that northern tribe I was telling you about. They're a minority tribe. They're Tonga is the name of the tribe. They speak a different language than in the belly and the Shauna. Some of the educated preachers speak English, but people in the villages only speak Tongan. So you have to have a translator, of course, when you work in those areas. Um, what we did was we had 44 Tonga-speaking preachers attend. Again, most not fluent in English. This work was planned by a couple of uh, very active preachers in that area, Short Mpunde and Peter Mudinda. They are both Tongan. Solomon Chikamba also helped us. He's actually in the belly, but he speaks some Tongan. Uh, so they're helping us in this work, get it organized, get these village preachers there. Um, 15 lessons on subjects such as Bible pattern, how God expresses authority, work and worship of the church. These are the base lessons that we do. Uh, but other things that they're interested in, instrumental music, marriage, social drinking, uh, baptism, basic things like that as well. The classes were held in a lodge on the banks of the Zambezi River. Uh, the men slept in a nearby building at an old fish camp. All of them piled into one pretty small building. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in just a little bit. Um, here is Short and his family, his beautiful family. They live actually in the town of Wangi, which is a mining town, a little bit better off than most of the towns in Zimbabwe because people are employed there. Uh, but Short works and preaches in uh, the village or the town of Wangi. So here we are teaching classes at Milabizi or Binga, as the broader area is called. You see the men, this is an open air pavilion, yet it has electricity, so we're able to use PowerPoint and all of that. Uh, Short was able to translate all of our lessons into Tonga ahead of time, so the guys had it in their language and were able to take that home with them, as well as translating as we're preaching along. Both Short and Peter helped with that. Here we are at the fish camp where the guys are staying. That building there to the right that you see in that picture, that's where 44 guys, <laughs> that's where 44 guys were sleeping every night. Uh, just on mattresses and things that were thrown in there. I think they must have been on top of each other. Um, but we had, a, we had a great stay there. Uh, the food is simple. People of Zimbabwe all over the country eat what they call sudza or mealy meal. It's just um, sort of a hominy grits that have been ground up real fine and made into a mush. They eat it three times a day if they can get it. Usually they can't. Uh, but it's as tasteless as you might imagine. Uh, but they like it, and it keeps them going. Uh, so that's what you're seeing there. There's the Zambezi River. Uh, crocodiles and hippos and everything to boot. Um, and here's, here's the group. As I said, you can, probably don't have any trouble picking me out in that picture. Uh, it's not exactly like Where's Waldo or anything. Uh, but there you see Joe and Tad in the back. Um, and this is Peter Mudinda and Short here who greatly helped in this... Uh, preparation and study uh, there. Well, after the three-day study was over, then we were able to go out to the village where Short is from. Simwangi is the name of it. There's the church building in Simwangi. It's a small uh, village. We met there on Saturday and again on Sunday. Here's Tad preaching and Short translating. Uh, there I am enjoying all of that with a child in my lap, and I enjoy the Zimbabwe children are beautiful and, and wonderful to get my, kid, my hugs from when I don't have my grandkids around to get hugs from. Uh, so it's an enjoyable experience. Here's a little congregation that meets in this village. Uh, these people are brightly dressed and they're happy. They're poor. This is one of the poorest areas in Zim and it is every bit as poor as it looks. This is actually Short's mother. This is where she lives. It's a hut. You don't see any electricity. There's no running water. It's very common in the villages in Zim for people to live exactly like this. Um, probably the majority of people in Zimbabwe live like this. Well, we go from Binga uh, down to uh, the village of Cross Deet. This would be on Sunday. We worship in Binga Sunday morning. We drove the, about three hours down to Cross Deet. 
And here a church is meeting in a school. Uh, this is a group that was started by Tinson Manguignana a couple of years ago. He preaches full-time up in Vic Falls, but he's come down to Cross Deep. He started two or three churches in this area and works with them. Uh, Tinson's a busy fellow. We support him from east side. He, uh, you see him down uh, here at the bottom uh, in the tie, and the fella standing next to him translating for us is uh, Solomon, who's driving us and helping us on this leg of our journey. So that's the group in Cross D. The next day, which was Monday, we go out to a place deep into the bush, let's say, uh, called Lupani. Lupani is the poorest area in Zimbabwe. We'd never been here before, but uh, Solomon had done some work in the villages here. There are about four churches in the region of Lupani, and he takes us out uh, on this day. Here's the, here's the road. This is the highway to Lupani that we're on for uh, an hour or two to get out to this place where the church meets under a tree. Uh, Solomon transports us. The brethren uh, were in great need of songbooks and less cowbell. You know, some of you may be aware of the, uh, you know, the more cowbell thing. <laughs> we had plenty of cowbell here. We had a bunch of cows going behind us, all of them wearing bells. I don't know why they all have to wear bells, but it, it sort of was louder than the singing at one point. Uh, but we had a really good day with the folks in, in Lupani, uh, many of them coming out and you say, as you see, just sitting on the ground, very common way that the churches in the villages meet and they're happy to come out and hear the gospel. Um, Joe and Tad did not cast their pearls before the swine at Lupani. We go from there the next day uh, down to Bulawayo, and Bulawayo is the second largest city in Zim. Uh, there are a number of congregations in Bulawayo. We've worked a, a number of times with the church at Hillside, which, is, as I said, is only one of two congregations that speaks English in their services. Uh, so they've lent us their building on occasions to have the native brethren in, and, and uh, we had a one-day lectureship at Bulawayo for the English-speaking preachers in that area. There are a number of them. Many of these are in the belly preachers, but they, they're able to speak English. Uh, a lot of good men in that group. And uh, Joe and Tad and I hit upon some uh, a little tougher themes and more detailed lessons. I taught on Revelation, for instance, uh, in some lectures that day. Uh, and the guys really seemed to enjoy that. So we enjoyed that day in Bulawayo. Then the next day we're out to Masvingo, And here, again, Solomon is helping us. And we, but we're picked up by... Uh, a fellow who works there at Hillside in Bulawayo. His name is Professor. That's his name, Professor. Um, and he has a son by the name of President. I don't know who's, you know, better in the family. They have some unusual names. I can just say that they give, uh, a lot of times they give their children just a, a common noun as their first name. Uh, I met one young man whose name was Obvious, you know. Uh, there's a... a preacher there in, in the, among the Indabelli whose name is Big Boy. I guess he was a big boy when he was born. I don't know. Uh, but a, a lot of the names are a bit unusual uh, to our ear, at least, the English names. The African names are even more unusual. But we're going out to Masvingo. Masvingo is an area, it's somewhat, um, for a country that has so many Christians and so many churches, Masvingo is a little bit of a missionary field, if you will. Uh, not as many churches in this area. Not as much work has been done in Masvingo. Again, it's a pretty poor area. There's a town of Masvingo, and then there's the province around it. Pretty poor, even for Zimbabwe. Um, and I'll show you some of the countryside in a minute, and maybe you can see why. We go to Panyanda Lodge, and now these brethren out in Masvingo are Shauna, they're not Indabeli, not Tonga. They're Shauna-speaking. Um, 33 uh, Shauna-speaking preachers. Most, again, not fluent in English. Um, there are few preachers in that province who speak any language as far as that goes. This work was planned by Professor Mashoko, who, again, translated all of our lessons. We got them to him ahead of time, translated all of them into Shauna for us. Solomon Chikambo again, helped with translation, as did Trimor Tezola and Shepherd Maviza. I think the church here may have had some uh, uh, fellowship with Trimor, or at least some of the people where he is, and I'll show you uh, some of Trimor. I've been around Trimor four or five different times in uh, traveling in Zim, and he's an he's a energetic young preacher, a lot of ability. 
Uh, but again, we had these lessons, the basic lessons that we did in uh, Binga. We did them here as well, some other lessons as well. Uh, these classes were held in a lodge in a wild game park. We find that those are the least expensive places to rent. You can't really get a big hotel if there is one in town somewhere. And so if you go get an old safari lodge or something like that, a lot of them not being used hardly at all anymore because the economy has collapsed and people don't go there for tourism much anymore. So you have these old safari lodges that are barely hanging on and they're happy to have you come. You can use those facilities. We've used those in a number of places. Uh, again, cooking is done by the wives of some of the brethren to feed the preachers. This is the hut that Joe and Tad and I stayed in there. Uh, it was fairly comfortable for Zim. We uh, can't complain about uh, the situation there. And the brethren were able to sit at tables in uh, one of the rooms there that's usually used for, uh, I think, the dining hall. Uh, but we, were, we just used it as a place to have our classes. 33 men in there. It was very cold. We go in the summertime here, but that's their winter. So some nights it'll get down uh, close to freezing, maybe not quite, and then up 75 or something during the day. Uh, but it's, it's very cold and dry there th that time of year. Here's Trimore translating uh, into Shauna for Tad Corder and Joe Greer. Trimore does a pretty good job, as well as a few of the other men uh, helped us out. These are the preachers there at Panyanda uh, that we... Uh, studied with, and you see them all holding up their booklets uh, of the lessons that were translated uh, for them. They'll be taking those home, preaching them in their villages, sharing that information with others on these vital topics. And again, I think you can pick Joe and Tad and I out of that, out of that picture. And there, uh, there's Trimore down there. People sometimes ask, well, do you, do you see any African wildlife? We do sometimes. We don't always. Uh, certainly not in the big cities, and depending on what part of the country you're in. This was a wildlife preserve, and so just out and around the huts, we would see animals like these. The giraffe came up. We could actually see them from where we were teaching the classes at one point, uh, and the, the several zebra around, and um, those are impala uh, in, in the field uh, near, near the lodge. We do get to see that, and that's just part of the blessing of going over there, uh, seeing a greater part of God's creation, and realizing how, how great and powerful and wonderful he is. Well, after our three days there at Masvingo, Joe left us to go back to the United States, and Tad and I went down to a place called Mirangiri. Uh, this is where uh, a, a brother that I've known for two or three years is doing some preaching and work. It's a new work. Uh, the brother's, brother's name is Kuda Kwashi, and uh, we call him Kuda for short. He likes that. Um, but again, a remote area. Here we are. They've set up a table. This is Sunday. Uh, it's the Lord's Supper table. There's Professor translating for me. And uh, most of the people are just sitting on a tarp. There are two or three plastic chairs around. Uh, the preacher, Kudakwashi, gets to sit in one of the chairs, as do the American preachers. That's, we get honored like that when we go places. The ladies almost always sit on the ground along with the children. And here most of the men sit on the ground as well. Um, but you might notice, as Kuda's sitting there, and I took this picture, besides a chair, notice what the preacher has that few others do. He has a Bible. It's very common to go preach in an area, and even members of the church won't even have a Bible. In this congregation, there were just a handful of people who had Bibles. Of course, it's a new church. Uh, a lot of these people were recent converts. Kuda had been doing a lot of work in this area in the past year. Um, and even the day that we were there, uh, we had two decide to be baptized that, pe that Kuda had been working with. So here's the river about 200 yards from where they're meeting. We go down to the river and uh, the baptism takes place. Pretty cool day, but uh, it doesn't matter to somebody who wants to be saved. Uh, they submit to baptism and they obey the command and receive the grace of God. That's a wonderful thing no matter where you are. And there might be somebody tonight even who's thinking about that. And uh, I think the water's warmer here, but it doesn't matter if you're ready to obey the gospel. We'll talk about that in just a minute. From Mas Vingo, we go up the long road to the capital city of Harare, spend the night there, Sunday night, and then Monday, we're out to a place called Wedza. And my interest in Wedza is this. The church at Eastside, uh, where I am in, a in Athens, supports Ten men in Zimbabwe. We, we support, help support 28 men throughout the world, but 10 of them are in Zimbabwe. 
and three of them preach in the district of Wedza. And that's a district I've never been to before, so we made arrangements to go out to Wedza. I can just say it is extremely remote. There is only a one-lane road that goes out there for about an hour and a half. You're on this road, oncoming traffic, you know, you have to get off the road and all that sort of thing. Uh, just a little bit frightening, frankly, but you get out there, and as I said, there are three congregations. Uh, this one has a fairly new little building to meet in. It's a brick building with a tin roof that's just been built in the last couple of years. Individuals from east side sent money over there for this congregation to build this building. Of course, we don't believe that a church can send money to another church to build their building. I don't think that fits the biblical pattern, but individuals can sure help if they want to. So individuals help build this building. Um, this is Tafadzwa, uh, who's translating for me. He accompanied me along with Reason Marara. I'll show you Reason in a minute. So here we are inside this building. It's a good group that meets here. Uh, some, of the, some of the children, a lot of children show interest. And uh, back against the wall there, you see a lady, uh, Sister Shaninga, who was there this last summer. She is the preacher's mother. And she was as proud of her son, Innocent Shaninga is his name. Uh, she was as proud as in, of Innocent as anybody could ever be. Two weeks ago, uh, Sister Shaninga passed away. And there's no money to bury anybody over there. There's no money to have a funeral. Uh, there's no money for relatives to come from out of town. And so individuals from East Side sent money over there for that. Uh, just so uh, Innocent's mom could have a good burial and relatives could come from out of town. Um, those are the kinds of needs that they have in Zimbabwe. She was a sweet lady. Here you see the whole congregation as it was. The building there at that time, the roof wasn't quite complete. They finished it since then uh, with some funds from individuals. Uh, next little group that meets in, um, in the Weds area is Moringa Berry. And we support a man by the name of Tawanda, who labors there. This is Reason, who was my driver and translator for the day. Uh, and there we are in Moringa Berry. There's Tad greeting the brethren. Very common there, um, when the service ends, they start singing a song, and somebody will go out the back door, and then somebody else goes out the back door, and the next person out the back door shakes the hand of the person that just went out the back door. Everybody's still singing the song, and everybody goes out and shakes the next person's hand all the way around. So they gather usually in a semicircle. This is in almost all the villages. This is their custom. And so they'll, they'll continue singing the song, uh, whichever spiritual song it is, until everybody's out and everybody has uh, shook everybody else's hand uh, all the way through. So there's Tad going down the line, shaking everybody's hand and everybody's singing. Uh, here's the church building at Moringaberry. Uh, it used to have windows in it. It used to be a better facility. Uh, it's pretty much just uh, open air right now. And then we went to the church that meets at Godzilla, uh, where uh, the church at Eastside supports Everson Dwati there. Uh, Everson's a tremendous young preacher, uh, eloquent in English, and Shauna as well. Uh, you can see the good group that meets at Godzilla. Um, there's the building such as it is. Uh, it's small. It's in need of things like walls and restrooms. Believe it or not, there's a town council that's been on them about making sure they have restrooms, which we would say were outhouses. Um, you need to have out, your outhouse done if you're going to have a meeting place like this, according to the, the village council. So that's what the bricks are for. They've been making bricks to get ready uh, to build their outhouses with that the town council wanted them to build. Uh, here, most of the ladies, again, sitting down on the ground outside the structure because there's no room for them inside the structure. Uh, as I said, Everson has done a lot of work here, and there's a good, strong church that's meeting here. There are suffering saints all over the world. There are suffering saints in Zimbabwe. The difference is nobody in Zimbabwe can afford to go to the hospital. Uh, if something comes up and, you know, you can't sell a cow or something, you're just going to have to live with it. Uh, in this picture, you see two people in the congregation there in Godzilla, um, a man without a leg and whose crutches were falling apart, a woman with a huge tumor-like growth on her neck, uh, got home to the east side last year, showed the brethren these pictures. 
Uh, they individually sent money for the brother to get crutches and for the woman to have an operation on that growth on her neck, and that was successful. So those are the kinds of needs you run across all over the country. Uh, there is poverty is endemic. There are needs everywhere. There's not enough money in all the congregations in America to solve all of the problems in Zimbabwe, and probably we shouldn't try, but we can help where we can. Uh, there's good to be done. There are saints who are suffering, who love the Lord like you love the Lord, and we need to show our love for them. Remember, uh, we're taking the love of God when we take the gospel to these places, and it's shown more than just in the gospel, but it's shown in how we really care about one another as we exist in this world and strive for the world to come. So that's the work that was done. We went the next day out to... Shevanau, which is a little village church where Reason Marara preaches, and there's the group in Shevanawa. Um, some of the faces in that meeting, typical Zimbabwe children, women, some men, uh, dedicated. How dedicated are they? Try this. At Shevanawa, these three gentlemen came walking up as we were waiting for services to start. Their ages range from 81 to 95. That's very old for Zimbabwe, where the uh, average lifespan is less than 60. So if you're 81 or 95, you're a very, very old person there, as you would be in America, probably, as far as that goes. Um, the 95-year-old walks five miles to attend every service of the church. 95 years old. And, you know, we can't get in our car to go down the street to make it to services. Uh, puts us to shame, really, their dedication People wonder, are, are, are these real Christians? Do they know the truth of the gospel? Do they love the Lord the way we love the Lord? Are they dedicated? Are they sacrificial? Yeah, they are. It's like America. You've got folks that are unfaithful. You've got folks that fall into worldliness. You've got folks that sometimes are not honest with you. But by and large, these are true saints. You can see it when they worship. You can feel it in their singing. You see it in men like these who aren't going to miss a worship service. Even in 95, they're going to be there to hear the gospel and love the Lord. And yes, there are lots of needs there all over the place. This is the church at Chittinguiza. Uh, Tenzin Manguignana's brother Josiah preaches at Chittinguiza. And uh, we were able to preach here the last day we were there last, this last year. I'm preaching there, and Taka is among those in attendance. I didn't get his picture, but I think you've had some fellowship with Taka as well. And uh, this is near his area. He came up to uh, visit with me that day. I've been around Taka three or four times as well. He is a tremendous gospel preacher. Uh, and somebody, when he leads singing, it sort of shakes the rafters. I should have uh, included, I've got a recording of him leading singing. A uh, very powerful uh, gospel preacher and song leader. Highlights of this trip last year. Our three-man team held two three-day classes for preachers, a one-day lectureship. We preached in nine different village churches, over 60 sermons uh, altogether. That's the work that we did in about two weeks. We traveled about 1,200 miles by car. I met about 70 preachers that we had not met before. In the previous four years that I'd been, uh, we had not met 70 of these preachers that we met this time. We witnessed the two baptisms. We had discussions with a lot of Christians about both their spiritual and physical needs. We received many expressions of thanksgiving for the support, the drought relief, the love received from American brethren. Uh, these brethren are truly thankful for any bit of help that you can afford them. When I go to Zimbabwe, I have a problem of people... Uh, before I go at the church at East Side and roundabout in North Alabama, um, just coming up to me and stuffing money in my pockets. Um, and I just take it all over there and try to use it for good. And so I had about $4,000 that people had just given me and said things like, use it for something good in Zimbabwe. And uh, some of it was $20 from a widow and some of it was two or 300 from somebody else. Um, so how is that used? Well, $200 for a bicycle for a disabled boy to travel to school, $500 for 
15 families who lost their homes in flooding at Chilocho. Solomon uh, took care of that. $150 for songbooks in Lupani. I showed you that they had cowbell, but no songbooks. So we provided songbooks in those areas. $320 for Bibles at Mirangiri. That's where the preacher had the Bible, but nobody else had a Bible. So we bought everybody in that congregation a Bible that didn't have one. Stanley Satole, a great in the belly preacher. His vehicle, he had a wreck, uh, needed repair. $400 toward that. $200 uh, for Tafadwa's wife, medical care. $250 for Bibles at Godzero, where Everson is. $300 for a printer for Josiah Manguignana. If they can print materials in their language, they can get those in the villages and really teach, do a lot of great teaching that way. And so some of the guys will ask for a printer for their work. It's a legitimate use uh, for a lot of those guys. There's $550 for additional support for preachers who were a lot of help in the work. Uh, 570 travel assistance for preachers who attended our classes to feed them, to provide transportation, and $425 for petrol for vehicles. So that came to $3,915. Besides the travel expenses and all that that went into it, it's not cheap to go over there. It's not uh, inexpensive to help brethren in the work, but it is very, very rewarding. I want you to understand when we talk about this work, we're talking about God's work and we're talking about God's love. Do we understand that? We're talking about God's love. We have a wonderful privilege, friends and brethren, to share in the love of God with people all over this world. I had a young man said in my office at Eastside a few months ago who was having really a lot of doubts about his faith. And he said to me, I don't know if I, if I believe in a religion, in a God that's just the God of white people in the American South, the Bible Belt. I told him, that's not the God that I know. I know a God who loves and is loved by people not only in Zimbabwe, but throughout Africa, really. There are a lot of Christians throughout Africa. Central America, South America, the Philippines, Asia. I've been to Australia. There are lots of Christians in Australia. All over the world, as Kenny said. But one of the things that we have here in America, and we're so blessed to have, is we have the ability to show our love in ways that people in the rest of the world don't have. I want you to understand something tonight. I was talking about the poverty level in Zimbabwe, $650 a month for a family of four. It's much, much higher than that in America. Something like over $20,000 a year, I think. Do you know that if you are at the poverty line in America, you are richer than 80% of the people in the world? You know all of those verses in the Bible that talk about how the rich ought to be and what they need to do with their money. Be willing to share, to communicate to those who have need. That's talking to you and me. We need to get off this business while we're not rich. We're the wealthiest nation on earth. Everybody in this room is wealthier than anybody I know in Zimbabwe. And we have a special, special blessing and gift to be enabled by the God of heaven to show our love. I'd encourage you to show your love. If it's not to Zimbabwe, the people all over the world who are your brothers and sisters who could use your help. Tonight, the love of God is for you. It's for me. And there could be somebody here who even as those two people in Zimbabwe did last year, could be somebody here who has decided to accept the love of God, to the gracious offer of the blood of His Son to cleanse you from your sins. And if you're ready to do that tonight and accept Christ as your Lord and name Him as that and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, we'd be happy to help you do that. We'd ask you to come while we stand and while we